So welcome everyone. This is the um, second um, question and answer session for the uh, ARDC uh, Nectar Research Cloud uh, Refresh um, RFP. So I'll just uh, very briefly, so ARDC has some funding to uh, provide a refresh to the existing Nectar Research Cloud to uh, with the idea of maintaining the, the capacity um, of what's now quite old equipment. So at the moment, the RFP uh, is out in a draft form um, for feedback and for your information. Um, the final version of the RFP will be released uh, on the 24th of October, and then there'll be a two week period for responses. Uh, and then the decisions will be made by the end of November. So uh, it's a fairly short time period for responses because you will have be able to have seen the RFP for several weeks beforehand to put um, um, ideas for proposals together and to discuss them with ARDC if, if required. So um, as part of the RFP process, uh, we've got the draft RFP out there and we wanted to have a couple of uh, Q&A sessions where anyone can ask uh, any questions about the RFP process. Uh, any questions in this session will uh, be, and the answers will go into the um, the FAQ so that anyone can have a look at the answers we provided to those questions. So um, unless, Ian, was there anything else you wanted to say as an introduction? No. So, uh, so we'll just kick it off and get started to, uh, if anyone has any um, questions, fire away. I do. <laughs> I thought you might, Steve. Yes, you can, you can be first, uh, first guy. Uh, so part A, page 13, talks about co-investment in section 4.4. Uh, one of the items for co-investment is infrastructure maintenance. Uh, during sort of when you do your acquisition, typically you'll, you'll acquire the equipment with a number of years maintenance sort of as part of that initial investment or part of that initial purchase. Is that maintenance component need to be separated out as co-investment or is that just part of the initial capital purchase? Ah, that's a good question. I don't think that's something we'd um, thought about. Uh, Ian, do you have any views on that? Yeah, it is a good question. I think if the co-investment is going to be regarded as, uh, if the maintenance is going to be looked at as part of co-investment, obviously it's not a piece that we would pay for out of the capital funding. Um, so let's have a little bit of a think about how we deal with that. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it, again, it is a fairly standard thing. Uh, not everyone tends to, to put things under maintenance, but I suppose most people would, would do. Uh, I, I would imagine, possibly, and again, I'll discuss this with Ian and we'll, we'll come up with an answer we'll put on the FAQ. I would have thought if you wanted to uh, have it as part of what was funded, that would fine, but you'd have to match it with additional co-investment. If you wanted to have it included as something you pay for that counts towards your co-investment, then that would also be fine. So I, I think to some extent we, we might just leave it up to you as to how you would want to, to play that. But I'll confirm, we'll have a chat afterwards with Ian and we'll confirm that and put it in the, in the, the, the final answer in the Q&A. Okay. Well, the FAQ, sorry. Yeah. Uh, next question is on page 14, which is with respect to practical completion. Um, so you need to operate this for three years. So is practical completion once it is commissioned or at the end of the three yes, years? Yes, it's once it's commissioned. Um, I'll check if that's not clear in the document. But yeah, the idea is is the infrastructure needs to pass some acceptance tests. Uh, we have to agree that it's you know, ready, it's up and running. And at that point, we'll sign off that you're done, essentially, because the, the capital funding is really just to the point where um, or, or the payment is just at the point where you have the infrastructure up and running. So that's a final pay on payment mil milestone. So yes, that's that's the, the completion of the of the project essentially where we, that we fund, um, in, at least in terms of the capital part. Yep. Uh, part B, page four. Let's get to that. Uh, so there's a 
AID, there's a reference to an AIDC data set and collection node. Is that just the old RDS nodes? Yes. That's yes. a term for that. Okay. Um, page five, 1.3. Um, so organizations provided funding under this program uh, research cloud nodes. And in section four, it talks about the steering committee will include representation from the successful research cloud node providers. So this was just that comment. Paul, just to confirm, so if an existing node uh, is unsuccessful as part of this process, are they still part of the steering committee um, or is it only the successful nodes under this program? Yeah, we haven't um, confirmed the, what the new steering committee will look like, but the expectation is it would be the major stakeholders. So it wouldn't, I would expect it wouldn't just be the successful groups if there are existing nodes that want to continue to federate into the research cloud <coughs> then they uh, I expect would be part of the steering committee as well it, it's really uh, to a large extent the point of that steering committee is to is to acknowledge that you know this isn't just a an ARDC service right it's an ARDC service done in collaboration with our partners and those partners need to have a say in how how that service is run so that would include uh, previous nodes if they are still part of that service yes yep is there any uh, section four also talks about the technical advisory committee and the resource allocation committee is there any indication as to the makeup of those is that does each node have a member of the TAC or is it just sort of the senior technical people so again we haven't decided on the makeup of that uh, and to some extent that would I, I think partly be directed by the governance sort of steering committee group but I would expect that it would include representation from again the, the partners in delivering the uh, the cloud infrastructure and possibly some external um, experts as well. Mm -hmm. uh, part D, page nine. Um, let's get to that. Uh, so it's around needing to fill out the for the research sector needs and benefits for seven, eight, and nine, given that this is effectively a refresh of, of previous or existing infrastructure, do we need to go through the completing out target research community? Um, we're not looking at significant, you know, we're not looking for you to have to put in a huge amount of, you know, listing all the research groups you support or whatever. It, it's really just as it was in the initial um, phase, uh, sorry, the initial uh, Nectar RFP, um, just trying to give an indication of the, the, the major research communities that you are looking to support. So we're not, you know, it's not meant to be an exhaustive list by any means. It's just trying to give an indication of, you know, some of the groups that are important that you're supporting. Give, and I, so I think it is useful to put some of that in given that, you know, this refresh is particularly focused on supporting national, um, nationally prioritised research and, uh, you know, increased capabilities and so on, it's important to at least put something in, in there to address that issue, yeah. yeah. Uh, and page 11, with respect to number 18 around communications and engagement, uh, it says, describe the means by which customer satisfaction with the proposed projects planning, et cetera, will be measured. Um, I wasn't around when the, the initial one was produced and I, like I know we run a customer satisfaction survey annually but that's more around you know the outputs of and, and use of the infrastructure I'm just curious as to whether there's any advice around how you would measure customer satisfactions with project planning yeah I, that that part again was carried over from the original one and I suppose the point there was just to try to ensure that um, the, the people you're, you know, the main groups I was just talking about, there's sort of main national groups that you're trying to support here are essentially part of the discussion of, of the sorts of equipment that you equipment. buy. We, we don't want to get to the point where, you know, we roll out all this equipment and the key groups we're trying to support come and say, well, that doesn't really meet our needs, right? It's, it's the wrong, it's the wrong sort of stuff. It's not enough or whatever. So, so it's really just to clarify how you are, I, I guess, give some confirmation that you are allowing those groups to provide some input into 
you know, what sort of infrastructure and what size of infrastructure is actually um, is going to meet their requirements and factor that in. Yep. Okay. So section 2.2 .2 talked about um, this acquisition was predominantly geared towards supporting a standard flavors. So if the research communities that we're supporting are looking for things beyond that, it's acceptable to effectively have a proposal that just supports you know, the say a large memory node or large memory nodes and GPU nodes, as opposed to necessarily the predominant flavors. Um, <coughs> I don't know if it would be acceptable to say it's just that and nothing else. I, I would have thought, um, I mean, it does say in the RFP, we're expecting to mostly support the standard flavors, but if you have a good reason with requirements from research groups that they want big memory nodes or GPUs or whatever, you should certainly say that and then that's fine, right? As long as there's, there's demand and it meets requirements for nationally prioritized research groups, having some, some of that sort of non-standard infrastructure is fine. Um, I wouldn't have thought that would be, uh, you know, take into account the entirety of, of the groups that we want to support with national um, uh, re, uh, prioritised research. The only thing they would want would be GPU nodes and big memory nodes. I would have thought there would have to be at least some capacity uh, from the standard flavours. But in terms of how much non-standard stuff you want, yeah, if you can make a case for it, then that's, that's fine. All right. Thank you. Uh, they're my questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Very good questions. Thanks, Stephen. Um, uh, Ian, sorry, did, was there anything I said there that uh, you wanted to elaborate upon? Or sorry, I, I, I think just touching on that last question, it's worth uh, remembering this is a capacity maintenance. It's not this stage of the investment in the cloud is not a not so much around evolving it into high memory nodes or slightly different flavored cloud so just bear in mind those non-standard flavors there needs to be some pretty robust discussion around that and how that might impact on the people who are relying on the more standard flavors at the moment thanks Ian. okay um do we have any other questions? Leslie, I can't believe you're not asking a question. <coughs> no. Okay, anyone else want to put up their hand for something? No, it could be a short session then. Is it worth pointing out, um, Paul, that we're going to try and actually fit in another draft and another yeah. consultation session after this? So we do have time to do that again. Uh, we're also trying to make sure that the drafts, as they appear, highlight the changes, so the deltas. Also, I think there's a word copy of the documents up there now so people can start filling it out and seeing where they run into some of these questions. Yeah, so now in, in the documents as well as the second version of the RFP, there is a, a document there on the website now that specifies what the changes are from version one, which are all fairly minor, uh, and a word version, as Ian said, if you want to start filling it out. So what we're looking at is there's still a couple of things in the RFP, <coughs> excuse me, that aren't quite specified yet and that includes um, uh, a sort of required specifications, the details of the required specifications for a node um, to meet, to, to include into the Federation. So we have a, an early draft of that. We expect to have that finished in, in a couple of weeks. Um, and we're expecting essentially to have a, a next version of the RFP that basically is done or pretty much close to being done. So we're looking oh, at plus, plus a draft contract um, for people to look at well beforehand and flag any issues and so on. So that's ex we're expecting to have that out by the end of the month. So essentially that would be a version three um, of the RFP um, and a draft contract and all the stuff that's currently, you know, a couple of things that are currently missing from the current RFP, the cloud specifications, the acceptance testing specifications. Um, so that should all be done by the end of September. 
and we and we wouldn't expect we'd expect very little change from the documents from then until they're released in the uh, in the 24th of October. So you should be able to put your proposal together um, well in advance of that using those documents. Uh, one. Am I unmuted? Yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, one further question, Paul. Um, yep. So both Dell and HP have got where we're coming out with some high density options uh, with respect to compute nodes um, around the Epic Roams. And mm -hmm. we've seen sort of one presentation from HP expecting to see something from Dell shortly, but the pricing on those is might still be a little way off before we can see those or availability for those nodes. So is a is at this stage, in terms of if we hit November and we still haven't seen sort of firm pricing, we're just looking at an indicative thing at this point and clarify that post the proposal? Yeah, I think so. Uh, <laughs> you could put indicative pricing or, or you could put, I mean, a standard thing that we tend to do with, you know, HPC leaf grants in the past, you put something in that's based on existing equipment and pricing for existing equipment. Um, and then, you know, a couple of months later when, when it's all good to go, you might revise that based on latest pricings and whatever. So I think that the, the plan for the RFP is you basically put in a, a fairly detailed specification of, and, and costing for what you want in, in the RFP. It's going to take, uh, you know, a month for us to decide on that. It's going to take a while to contract it. And then the next phase is you would put in a um, essentially a, a quote to say this is exactly what we're going to buy and 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 we and ARDC would approve it so that's not going to happen before January right okay so, so, think so I would have thought there's certainly scope for you to revise what you'd propose based on new pricing etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and as long as it doesn't deviate too much from what was agreed uh, I would have thought we would say that's fine okay thanks and does that seem reasonable All right, um, so one final chance for anyone to ask any final questions before we wrap up. No. Nope. All right, I think unless anyone, Ian, anyone else has any comments before we go, then I believe we're done. So uh, <clears throat> as I said, the, the, the questions that were asked today will, will be added to the FAQ and this video will be um, put up on the um, on YouTube for others to have a look at who weren't able to make it. All right, thanks very much everyone for attending and uh, have a good morning. Thanks, Paul. Right. Thanks, Paul.